Welcome to the ECS Podcast. I'm Rocky Calvo, Executive Director of the Electrochemical Society. The purpose of this podcast is to connect the dots between the sciences, our everyday lives, and the sustainability of the planet. With us today is Dr. Christian Amator, who has given a new direction to molecular electrochemistry and has a pioneering role in the development of ultra-microelectrodes worldwide. So welcome, Dr. Amator. So thank you. Welcome to all the people who are listening. Uh, we uh, would like to start this off by talking about uh, the beginning, I guess, where you were born and, and mm-hmm. what was going on. I, I think there was some unrest at the time. This is in 1950 in Algeria. And I'd uh, mm-hmm. just like to uh, tell us whether that had any effect on you and what was going on uh, early in life. Okay, uh, this is a very uh, interesting question because, uh, in fact, uh, that has more effect on me now when I am thinking about uh, what uh, was going on at this time. But as a kid, we were kind of uh, protected by our parents, okay? So we were living in a world, okay, uh, evidently uh, there were things that now I would not consider normal, but at the time they were normal. Like my father going uh, to battle uh, for three weeks, we will not see him and he will come back. But since he was coming back each time, uh, this was normal. He was, uh, we were just proud uh, that uh, our father was a warrior. Okay, you, you, you understand that kind of feeling? When you are a kid, oh, sure. you integrate uh, the, what is going on in a different view as you can uh, read again or listen to uh, understand again when you are an adult okay so in fact uh, there was no problem at all uh, we were always in small cities because my father was in garrisons uh, that were rather small and uh, for us there was no problem uh, of interaction between the French, between the Muslim, between the Jewish, and so on. Everything was going on on the basis of uh, who is a good guy, who is a bad guy, uh, in terms of behavior, but not uh, in terms of the religious or social appartenance. So, and we were poor people, okay, so we were in the bottom of... Uh, so there was not a big difference between a French and a Muslim in this range of the society uh, is completely different from the big guys uh, who had, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a lot of uh, uh, colon. In French we say colon, the people who were the colonists, okay, uh, with uh, big farms and so on. So, he, in fact, uh, is now that when I am thinking, I say uh, this was not normal, but at the time that was a normal life. Mm-hmm. Uh, about how old were you when uh, you, you said your father was in the, the French Foreign Legion and uh, he went off uh, for weeks, you said, uh, at a time. Yeah. Uh, uh, how old were you when, when he was leaving? Uh, when, uh, because my father uh, was in the Saharian companies, okay? Uh, so uh, when they were receiving information that a uh, troop of... Uh, uh, I would say uh, people from the resistance was coming uh, from uh, Tunisia across the Sahara. They were trying to intercept these uh, guys, okay? Mm-hmm. So, but they were not knowing exactly what was the route, so they had to uh, 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 span a lot of uh, territory. But then when there was a meeting between the two troops, okay? The, there was a battle, maybe one hour, two hours, and then, uh, I, okay, I will tell you something which uh, has marked me. Uh, with my brother, we had uh, remarked that at one moment, after one or two weeks, there would be helicopters coming uh, from the south, okay, and going uh, nearby us, okay. And uh, we were we had made uh, a kind of Pavlov business that when we will see these helicopters, the next day my father will be home, back at home. Okay. So for us to see these helicopters was very uh, nice. Okay. Mm-hmm. But my mother was uh, uh, crying, and with my brother we could not understand because for us he was joyful because our father will be back. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because we were not knowing he was in the battle, okay? He was just gone, 
with the army, uh, maybe do some tralala in the Sahara and come back, okay? We were completely kept out of this uh, business of the uh, battle uh, wars and so on. But my mother was counting how many uh, on this helicopter they were putting the dead on the side of the helicopter. So my mother was counting how many dead they were, okay? And so she was wondering if my father was one of these guys, okay? So she was crying. I see. But for us, we were laughing because we were happy. We were saying hello to the helicopters and so on because we were knowing that next day my father will be back. Yes, and I fortunately, he has been always back. And, and um, you said uh, earlier that that's uh, you. You obviously have a different perspective uh, of yeah. this whole thing now as an adult because now you know what was going on. Yeah. Yeah, and it, I started to know uh, what uh, to understand what was going on. The last year we were, I was ten year, okay, and I understood that something was uh, because I saw a real uh, guy being killed in front of me, oh. okay. Uh, so that has marked me. I still remember this picture of this guy being killed. Uh, okay, uh, uh, at the time they were not psychologic. Mm -hmm. So I always remember that. And what uh, scared me a lot is that most of the people were looking at that just to look, you know, like when there is a car accident on the highway, okay? People uh, try to have right. a glimpse of what right. is going, but nobody is making any empathy, okay? And with my brother, uh, we had the empathy for this poor guy who had the head blown uh, by a bullet, okay? And that is a picture which is still in my... Uh, <coughs> and made me think uh, differently. Yes, I can imagine that had uh, a great influence on you. I, I, I have the sense that your father had uh, a great influence on you. And I have a, I have a quote, and you'll have to pardon me if, um, if this translation is not exactly correct. But uh, it's my understanding. He said something to the effect that if you're smart, but you do not have education, your dumb remains. Is that yeah. is that fairly accurate? Uh, almost, uh, because my father has been, uh, uh, he, he is dead now, he was a very smart person, and I am sure that if he had benefited of the same uh, education as I got, okay, uh, he would have been uh, maybe a great scientist or a great doctor or whatever. And uh, that was the same for my grandfather in Sicily, okay? My grandfather, to uh, give food to his family, went, uh, immigrated to the States, and he walked in Florida to, bring, to put the railroad on the west oh. coast of Florida. Okay. Okay, then went back to Sicily and uh, bought a little uh, piece of land to uh, give food to his family. And then when my father was grown up, for some circumstances that would be too long, to, he found himself uh, in France incorporated in the foreign legion okay and uh, also he has been uh, under officer okay at the maximum he was adjutant and he has been always commended by officers that were with uh, lower intelligence than him but uh, with they were officer because they had received the adequate instruction mm -hmm. uh so my father always told me if uh, you are smart you are intelligent as much as you want, but you cannot speak because you uh, uh, have not the correct instruction. You will be always considered like dumb. And how did uh, you uh, get the opportunity uh, to pursue the education that your father and your grandfather uh, did not have? Yeah, the thing uh, is that uh, after the Second World War, uh, we had the contrary of what we see today. We had the great expansion, okay, of economic. And France was knowing that he was needing a lot of scientists, uh, medical doctors, and so on. A much um, a larger number that the traditional class of educated po population could pro produce. So the elementary teachers were charged to detect who were the brilliant students, 
uh, kids and to convince the parents to push the students, uh, the kids, to go further and further. So each time I have, uh, and that I learned only five years ago, okay? Uh, for me, uh, the thing has been going like this, but the teacher were telling uh, my parents, call my parents, tell, okay, Christian needs to do that. And my parents have been always trusting the system. And so for them, it was very difficult financially, but they always did what the teacher said, okay? And from each teacher, okay, is like having uh, a Virgil uh, grid, okay, that has been uh, uh, tailoring my uh, path up to when I was 18 and I started to be able to drive my life, uh, my education life myself. And so, yeah. Well, I... So uh, that that got you started on an an, an educational path. Uh, can you tell us how it led to science? Uh, now you did mention they were looking for medical. Okay, I, I was I, I was not good at science. Okay, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, since uh, I have I was uh, I, okay, it's pretentious to say that, but uh, I was more developed than my real age. So all my friends were older by one year or two years of me, okay? And uh, in France, you go to school at six, to the elementary school, okay? At the time, there were no kindergarten and so on, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, at uh, one time in uh, October, all my friends disappeared because they went to school. And I wanted to go to school, but they will never take me because I was one year and a half too young. So my mother uh, learned to me to uh, write and read, but I was not good at calculus. So the next year, uh, since I was born in December, my mother negotiated with the teachers that I could get one year before because uh, that was the scholar year, okay, not uh, uh, official year, and plus one year before because the teacher uh, uh, realized that I could read and uh, write and he said to my mother, okay, if we can learn the calcula calculus in uh, the first month, we will put him one year uh, ahead. So in this fact, that I never did the first year of school, and I entered in the second year of school two years in advance. And uh, then I had no problem to go, and uh, I was more uh, interested in the reasoning. I have never been able to do calculus. I should confess, but don't speak <laughs> to anybody, okay? Okay, I but won't. You just did, though. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know my multiplication tables, okay? I have never been able to learn the multiplication tables, but I can learn without any problem uh, any logical equation. So, I, uh, and then I was glad because in neuroscience now they know that this is different part of the brain. The one who is making the calculus, okay, one plus one, and the one who is making the multiplication table, all that is a different part of the brain that is handling the Cottrell equation or the Fick laws and so on. So, in fact, uh, as soon as it started to be bearing onto the reasoning, I started to love the uh, science which was essentially natural science, because that was giving me a light on the world. So I was uh, having the world in front of me, and a lot of things uh, at school, I could receive the explanation for why it is like this or why it is not like this, okay? And when I was at home, uh, I was always asking to my parents questions, and my father and my mother will give me always answer. Now I know that... Uh, 90% of the case, the answer was wrong, okay? But it was very logical. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the world was logical, and the rationalization of the world was uh, by the logical uh, thing, and that has dr uh, driven me to the science without any problem. So, uh, and now that you've, you've uh, been driven in that direction, you uh, pursued it at a higher level at ENS, which is one of the, the leading French educational research centers. Yeah. 
Um, did I jump too quickly? Was there something that happened n now that you've got to focus on science? Is there something, is there, are there mentors or, or any other things that, that got you there? Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, initially I was more a mathematician, okay? Because uh, the main courses in science in France uh, at the, what is the high school is uh, mathematics, okay? Physics and chemistry and biology are... Uh, I, but uh, minor compared to mathematics. So I had no problem with the mathematics, and everybody who reads my paper uh, in electrochemistry can tell that I have no problem in mathematics. But I realized that mathematics was a tool for me. I could not create in mathematics, okay? I was happy to do what I was supposed to do just because I did it, but not because I learned something. Hmm? Mm -hmm. But in physics, I could, und I could learn why uh, it is this way, why it is not this way, uh, what is a rainbow, for example, or whatever, uh, how come there is a rainbow. Um, so all this kind of stuff. Uh, and that was uh, telling me that this was the way to understand the world. And then uh, when I was 18, Okay, before that, if you had told me I would become a chemist, I would have told you, uh, change your crystal ball, it does not work, okay? Chemistry, <laughs> no. Okay? And then I got <coughs> a fantastic uh, professor in chemistry, and this guy made me understand that chemistry was still uh, was a real science, and it was still something that needed to be polished, okay? Uh, you cannot have the Newton law in chemistry, okay, and so on. Uh, because uh, in chemistry, uh, too many things are competing together, and uh, but if you have an understanding, you can separate the things, okay? So then I, I felt very interested in uh, chemistry and decided to become a chemist. And I wanted to be an organic chemist to make uh, synthesis of molecule. And then I understood that this has to go like the multiplication table. You have to learn a lot of data for the case one day you will need it, okay? Uh, but these data uh, are not necessarily things that are rationalized by a simple law or by simple logic. You have to know that uh, if you do this reaction with this co-reactant, you get that. If with an another co-reactant, you will get something else, okay? So this is knowledge that you have to store. And I decided this is not for me, but I was introduced to the physical uh, chemistry during this course. And the physical chemistry was a beautiful physics because it was a physics that was addressing the real world, yeah, mm -hmm. to me. Uh, so I decided I would become a physical chemist. And then I had the electrochemistry and uh, Nernst law, titration, uh, you know, all this business. And I say, one, sure, one thing which is sure is that I will never become an electrochemist. And uh, the last course uh, of uh, what is, uh, okay, I would say three years before the PhD, the professor, the last half hour of the last uh, course, he showed us uh, polarography and the Eroski and uh, the Nernst layer and I understood that immediately that was an exceptional thing because you could make intermediate uh, near the electrode, analyze them through the current and so on. And uh, immediately at Ecole Normale Supérieure, I said to my uh, uh, mentors, I want to do electrochemistry, but this kind of electrochemistry, okay, what is called today molecular electrochemistry. Right. And this is the way I became what I am. <laughs> so never say no, I will not, uh, in France we say, uh, spring, never say, spring, I will never drink your water, okay? Because you may be forced and uh, find this water is the most uh, delicious in the world. I like that. Um, that's a good, uh, good way to characterize it. So, after you finished your education, so let's talk a little bit about how uh, you advance in your career now that you've sort mm -hmm. of uh, found this interest and this aptitude. Um, you finished your education. Did you have a, a big break, or what was your first big opportunity? Okay, in France, the uh, system is uh, rather channeled, okay? So when you are a brilliant student, uh, 
you pass uh, to enter. Okay, Ecole Normale Supérieure, the success rate, for example, when I entered the Ecole Normale Supérieure, we were the 11 best uh, physicists and chemists of our generation over France, okay? So that uh, is a high rate of selection. So that means that after, if we follow the studies and we develop as a professor who selected us, think we are, uh, we were, generally you are good meet for the people from the research. So you receive a lot of opportunity. And since I wanted to do what I was defining this molecular electrochemistry, uh, I was uh, directed towards Savion's lab, uh, Jean-Michel Savion. Oh, yes. Okay. And so I started to do my uh, master with him and then my uh, PhD. But at the time, the PhD in France was for the most brilliant people, uh, doctor, uh, state doctorate. So usually that was eight years, but mine was in five years. Okay. And during this five years, the first thing uh, Savion taught me uh, to do uh, was a system that when the way he put to me, I thought it was a test to know if he will keep me in the lab or not. I spent two years and half of my life to try to solve that. And when I solved it, Savion told me, congratulations, because Bard broke his teeth on that. Feldberg broke his teeth on that. Evans broke his teeth on that. Hanson broke his teeth on that. I broke my teeth on that, and you solved it, okay? And uh, that was terrific, because if he had told me that at the beginning, I would have uh, left the key of the lab uh, on my desk and escaped. <laughs> but he didn't... So he, he always pretended this is easy, so I solved this thing. And then uh, I thought, uh, discussing with him, of some things that was electron transfer catalysis. So how you can make a reaction that is not consuming or producing electrons, but can be catalyzed by electrons, okay? So, in fact, uh, uh, I, in the second part of my uh, doctorate, I solved this thing, and then here I saw one thing that was very important, that is one of the reasons why electrochemistry is hardly a selective method for organic preparation, is that when you transferred one electron over one volt, which is an average of the energy you transfer, in fact, you are transferring 100 kilojoule in, uh, per mole in one molecule, okay? Mm -hmm. And this molecule is like a guy who is winning the lotto, okay? He, he receives uh, suddenly uh, several million of dollars, and if he has not a banker to manage that, the correct banker, I mean, okay, not the banker of uh, we have today, okay? Right. Uh, uh, then the guy will spend everything in six months and will become even more poor than before, okay? Okay. In, uh, in chemistry, this is called uh, uh, no selectivity. You will make plenty of subproduct, but none is in of interest, or the one which is interest is 10%, and the rest, uh, the rest is garbage, okay? So I thought uh, it's because we push too much energy in the thing, but if we use organometallics, now these organometallic centers, they have uh, plenty of orbitals with the D orbital and so on. They can fill in the energy and release in the substrate, okay, and make a catalytic cycle. And at this time, there was here in Indiana University, uh, a tremendous guy named uh, Jay Kochi, who was uh, uh, older than me, okay? At the time, he was 50 or 55, uh, and I was 30, okay? At what university? And at Indiana University, where I am oh, now. Oh, where you are now, okay? yes, yes. And uh, Kochi was uh, arriving to a similar conclusion, and so uh, he produced uh, one or two papers that I read in uh, JAX, and I decided I would postdoc with him. And he was so excited that I come here that he made me a visiting assistant professor at uh, uh, Bloomington uh, at uh, Indiana University. And so I spent one year here. I enjoyed a lot uh, what I did, produced uh, many works, 
and that has established me uh, in the domain. And this is where I met uh, Mark Whiteman. Mm -hmm. And with Mark, uh, we decided, uh, Mark had uh, started to do uh, a small electrode, okay, micro electrode, but uh, at the time they were like 50 micrometer or something like this. And he found uh, some interesting uh, result. And we were always discussing together and we decided that uh, we needed to establish this new field. And uh, when I returned to Paris, I was uh, uh, promoted full professor. I was the youngest full professor in France, and I was, uh, I was 32, and we started to work together in collaboration, and this collaboration has, doing, has been during 20 years. And during these 20 years, we have established uh, what is really together. We have established what is uh, now uh, known as uh, microelectrode, ultra microelectrode, and nanoelectrodes. Uh, all the theories, the demonstration of what uh, the laws you have to use and so on. Okay, many other entered the system also, uh, so we have not been alone. But yes. Like you said, uh, we have been a kind of uh, driving. That was a time when people were not interested in this kind of small electrode, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, you uh, you said you were the, the youngest uh, full professor, and this is at ENS, uh, at 32 years. H how much longer mm -hmm. did you stay there before you moved on to uh, CNS? No, in the CNRS is uh, the same as NSF in this country. Right. But in this country, uh, in the U.S., uh, NSF, uh, the people who are appointed by NSF works in... Uh, excuse me, national labs, uh, not NSF. CNRS is both national labs and NSF, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. At the uh, national level, okay? So he appoints uh, people the same way as the national labs appoint people here in, this, in the U.S. But in the U.S., the people who are appointed by the national lab work in the national lab, yeah? Yes. In France, CNRS made a deal with universities or institutions like Ecole Normale Supérieure and so on. And uh, they make uh, what we call the uh, uh, joint uh, research team. Oh, I see. And the most brilliant uh, research team uh, that are in France belong to uh, the institution and to CNRS. At this moment, CNRS is able to put position in this research team and you uh, for example my position is a cnrs position to work in my research team at Ecole Normale Supérieure. so what was your respons so responsibility at, at crnrs uh, at cnrs uh, just doing research like uh, 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 professor uh, in this uh, university after i got uh, over responsibilities because uh, they ask you also to be involved uh, in administration of research, to pay, be part of councils and so on. They ask the people who have been uh, getting a good recognition to be part of that. But uh, this is on the side. Uh, the main work is really to be like uh, any uh, university professor in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd also uh, like to... You, you've You've had some other uh, interesting and very prestigious positions, including the, the French High Council for Science and Technology. Um, I'd just like to ask you, you know, what about your experience with that, advising the President of France on scientific matters? Okay, okay, uh, I, I, okay. President Chirac, uh, Jacques Chirac, decided that uh, uh, science was not uh, sufficiently well driven uh, in France. So he created this uh, High Council for Science and Technology, and uh, we have been 20 people, uh, known for our uh, uh, records, to be uh, uh, appointed in that. So we were two chemists, Jean-Marie Laine, Nobel Prize, and me. Mm -hmm. The other were physicists or engineers or biologists, uh, medical people, and so on, okay? And we were 20. And uh, when uh, the government had uh, some uh, need for an advice, they will ask us to produce an advice uh, that uh, was a kind of uh, council, okay, uh, for the uh, 
better management of some issue in research, okay? So that was a fantastic uh, three year of my life. And then President Chirac uh, uh, finished his office of president. We had uh, Sarkozy. And Sarkozy didn't want to have any council because uh, uh, the problem is that the council uh, can say do this and uh, he does something else and then this uh, does not work. But the newspaper people, media will say, but your council said that you should not do that, okay? So he solved the problem by dissolving the council, okay? Oh, that's unfortunate. So the, but I've been uh, very happy and also, when I am in the Academy of Science, I have been uh, participating in a lot of uh, advice because in France, like uh, uh, the NIS here in the States, uh, uh, we are advisor to the government, but it's more informal advising, okay? okay. The high council, it was a direct communication with the president. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, it's, it's now uh, time to come back to your research interests a little bit more. As uh, we said in the beginning, uh, and we say on each one of these uh, programs, that what we're trying to do is uh, uh, share more about how, how your research has practical applications, where we see it having uh, effects on people's lives, or wh whatever. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you've told us a bit about uh, you know, your work with Mark Reitman as a, a pioneer in, a, in microelectrodes. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more, more where, where it's led? Okay, I will tell you one thing, okay, if you permit, okay. Uh, it's a story about uh, a very well uh, known electrochemist, uh, Michael Faraday, okay. Michael Faraday. Uh, uh, was visited by the Prime Minister of England in his own laboratory at the uh, Royal Institution, okay, in London. And Michael Faraday demonstrated, uh, you know, the, the classical experiment where you take uh, a magnet and you put the uh, iron filling and you see that the iron filling are making lines uh, uh, that are going out of the magnet and uh, from the North Pole and go to the South Pole. You, you know that kind of thing, okay? Mm -hmm. And the Prime Minister was sufficiently smart to understand that there was something going, pouring out of this magnet, okay, that you cannot sense with uh, your feeling, okay, but he was here because he's able to organize the iron feeling, okay? And uh, he said, uh, Professor Faraday, uh, this is fantastic. Uh, this discovery will have uh, many as applications. What are the uh, applications? And Faraday say, okay, uh, Mr. P uh, Prime Minister, I don't know any application of that, okay? <laughs> but I am sure that within 30 years, there will be application done by other people, and you will get a lot of taxes out of them. And in fact, uh, he was a visionary because 30 years after you had the first electrical engine and you had the first big alternators to make the electricity. And today, uh, all the energy which is powering the world, except uh, most of the cars that are still in the combustion, this is electricity and is produced by the alternators that are built on the Faraday thing. So it's very difficult because to foresee the application, the scientists, we are interested in to understanding what is going on. And it is uh, generally over people who will find the application uh, by uh, putting uh, this result with this result and think about application. Because application means economy, okay? Mm -hmm. And the scientists, we do not understand anything in the economic <laughs> okay. Uh, trends, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, if we were smart in that, maybe we will be not scientists, okay? Okay, so fair enough. I you won't understand? ask you to speculate about what no, you think. No, I, I think uh, <laughs> what I can tell you is uh, this micro electrode that we developed at the beginning with Mark Whiteman, it was for the fancy of understanding the new phenomena, okay? Mm -hmm. That has led us to open a new world, okay? with many applications, I would say academic applications. And then now, in many uh, analytical labs in the world, 
people are using uh, microelectrodes the same way uh, I, when I was a student I was using polarography, okay? And when I am coming to uh, in China or whatever, give a talk, and people speak to me about uh, how microelectrodes are good, they don't realize that I am one of the two guys who invented that. Hmm. And when I say to them, but do you know who invented that? They speak to me like uh, this has always been existing. Yeah. <laughs> I say, no, no. <laughs> uh, go and see these papers, okay? And then the next day they come, say, but this paper, this was you, okay? And I become a god, okay? <laughs> you, you understand? I so understand. These people, these people will make uh, the application. For us, uh, Mark and me, we are developing our own applications to understand the, what we are of interest. So I use a microelectrode uh, applied to organometallic to understand the mechanism of organometallic catalysis. For example, most of the mechanism of the, what was the Nobel Prize of palladium cross-coupling that are now in the advanced textbook have come from my lab and they were built with the microelectrode. Without the microelectrode, you could not uh, solve this mechanism. Uh, we are doing, uh, 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 trying to understand the vesicular exocytosis or oxidative stress or the free radicals uh, and so on. But we produce uh, things that are not real direct applications. They need to be integrated on into something else to become applications. Mm -hmm. So today uh, our world is confusing. So uh, six months ago, I, somebody told me one of the greatest uh, genius uh, scientists in the world was Steve Jack, uh, Jobs. I said, Steve Jobs, he invented nothing in science, okay? He's not a scientist, but he was a fantastic uh, designer of future application because this is the guy who understood that people were fed up to use the keyboards on the uh, telephone okay mm -hmm. and they wanted to have picture on the telephone he invented uh, the concept of the iphone then he asked a lot of engineers and the engineer used plenty of things that the academics had produced and integrated this in the iphone okay so this is the way the applications are born. It's not uh, from generally by the academics people themselves, because we don't know okay, what will be the application that will be the most useful, where you make the most money uh, for the society. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So I will uh, move on to a different line of questioning. I think uh, you, you've talked uh, about um, your experience, both educational and, and your, your research. And that, that leads me to, I, I think, an interesting question about uh, the, the Electrochemical Society and, uh, that, that I work for and the other professional societies mm -hmm. that you participated in. And that has to be that um, the question is, a lot of the work that you've done really highlights the importance of interdisciplinary research, like, yeah. in, a, in a discipline like uh, electrochemistry. So. Um, why is working across these boundaries so important? Okay, uh, one of the things is maybe what I smelled when I was uh, young, when I was like uh, 22, 23, when I decided that I would become a little chemist, is that uh, electrochemistry is a science by itself. It's not a part of chemistry, it's not a part of physics, it's not a part of... Uh, because Everywhere in the world, you have this interfacial uh, system in which you transfer energy across a boundary, okay? So when you do that with an electrode, you call it electrochemistry. But when a cell is doing it, the cell does not call it electrochemistry, but you're in your mitochondria, you are making electrochemistry in order to produce the energy that will be converted in the proton gradient, which is again electrochemistry, which is uh, transformed by the ATP synthase into the ATP that becomes the currency for the energy in every other compartment of the cell. So you see, electrochemistry is everywhere. So it's a central science. It's the same as uh, organic chemistry is everywhere in the living world. Yeah, Every uh, mm -hmm. chemical reaction that is going on in the cells is organic chemistry. Electrochemistry is the same, 
But electrochemistry is only one uh, in these techniques that is dealing with both the reactivity and the importance of uh, spatial uh, requirement. Uh, so when uh, you are making an electrolysis, you are converting something which is in a three-dimensional uh, domain by reacting at a two-dimensional domain, or even if it's a nano-electrode at a one-dimensional domain, to be converted. So this is very, very important because you find that everywhere in the world, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, in the nature, you, you have that uh, in the clouds, you have that in the roots of the trees, you have that uh, everywhere, okay? In the photosynthesis, uh, so you name a phenomenon uh, of nature, you will always will find electrochemistry. Yes. And now, uh, today, uh, but electrochemistry generally is taught only to electrochemists. So most of the chemists, most of the physicists, they don't know that electrochemistry is everywhere. And this is a pity, okay? Electrochemistry should be taught to the freshman. Stop with the NERNS equation, stop with the batteries and so on. Okay, that is uh, just uh, is important for, uh, I would say, uh, uh, money producing, okay, uh, industry. But the concept of electrochemistry are more wide than electrochemistry. And in fact, electrochemistry is by itself an interdisciplinary uh, science. And so when I am doing biology or organometallic chemistry or fundamental electrochemistry, before now people know that I am the same person. But before they were thinking there were three or four amateurs because uh, the biologists were knowing my result in biology, the organic people, my result in organic chemistry and organometallic chemistry, the electrochemist as an electrochemist. But nobody was realizing I was the same guy. Yeah. Uh, Okay, and in fact, it's just because electrochemistry, people do not realize, is by d definition an interfacial technique and uh, science. I, I, I just want to come back to, or maybe just have you expand a little bit more, you were talking about the important role of electrochemistry, and, and now with... Uh, some of the world's most pressing issues in, in energy yeah, 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 or yeah. sanitation or medicine. I mean, can you tell us more about what you think the, the impact of electrochemistry should be having on, on these problems? Yeah, I believe, uh, okay, the energetic problem is one problem that uh, only electrochemistry can solve, okay? Material science driven by electrochemistry, okay, uh, will solve because when you want to make a fuel cell, you have to understand the electrochemistry. When you want to make a supercapacitor, you need to understand the... When you need to, to make a, a sodium ion uh, batteries, you need to understand the electrochemistry. And uh, all that has to be coupled with material science, okay, uh, people. So again, this is interdisciplinary, okay? So today, uh, if we want to convert and store the energy, for example, when we are speaking about uh, photovoltaic or windmills and so on, these energies are intermittent, okay? So uh, if we want to use this energy, which is the plan of the governments in uh, most of the uh, 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 modern countries, you need to have a way to store the electricity. And what most of the people do not understand is electricity is like a river. The river is flowing, and this defines the river, okay? But uh, uh, if you want to store the energy carried by the river flow, you need to make a dam. And how you make a dam? In uh, electrochemistry, this is called a battery, okay? And now, how you convert the uh, water that has been stored in the dam, in the battery, into uh, workforce, you need to have the alternator, okay? And uh, for electrochemistry, this is uh, the fuel cell, okay? So uh, everything, I think, electrochemistry is essential and will be more and more essential in the future for having uh, environmentally correct uh, energy. The same uh, if you want to have... Uh, to stop the pollution uh, by the cars in the big cities and so on, the only solution is either the hydrogen 
uh, engine or the fuel cell. So that means the fuel cell, okay, or the electric coal with the batteries. So again, this is electrochemistry. So I think we are in the bloom of uh, the need of electrochemist uh, today, and this is what you see in the ECS by the growing member uh, membership, and what we see in the International Society of Electrochemistry, uh, of which I am the president, we see also a blooming. And this is uh, showing that in most of the countries, there are more and more positions of engineer of academic position into electrochemistry because finally the world understood that electrochemistry is crucial, that without electrochemistry, you cannot solve these problems, okay? So this is one. Now, for a better understanding of biology, uh, I think uh, the electrochemical concept, the bioanalytical uh, measurement, and so on, are also electrochemistry and will be useful today uh, when you go and make a blood uh, analysis or serum analysis or whatever analysis. Most of the things are done by classical enzymatic reaction, but that use a lot of uh, material. This is long. Uh, more and more you see sensors. For example, you have the uh, Adam Heller uh, sensor for glucose, and now a person can monitor himself or herself uh, in continuous. And this is electrochemistry again. So I think there will be plenty, even more applications that we can dream in it, uh, uh, from electrochemistry in the future. And I think uh, this will be the reasonable place of electrochemistry because, I, as I told you, most of the natural things that we have in front of us is electrochemistry. Yes. Uh, and, and thank you for all of that. That's, um, I mean, you know, clearly the, the number of applications, the, the importance uh, to the future of, of many things, energy, medicine, sanitation, water, communications, uh, it's all there. Um, that, that has been part of uh, the initiative uh, that ECS has been, and many, many uh, uh, publishers and uh, professional societies have been moving towards, uh, and I, I wanted to ask you a question, really from your perspective as as an editor and, a, and, a, and an author of, of a very important body of knowledge, and that has to do with uh, advancing the science through our publications and mm -hmm. how we're moving towards open access, uh, greater availability. Do you do you have any feelings about this movement uh, for okay. in publishing? I, I, yeah, I have feelings, but, uh, okay, uh, I will tell you, when I was a student, I will go uh, each week to the library, and I could read, uh, not read the full journal, but I could read uh, Jacks, okay, I could read uh, uh, GS, okay, uh, Journal of Electrochemical Society, I could read the Journal of Electronical Chemistry. Uh, uh, so in these two, I was reading most of the paper, which explained my uh, wide knowledge in electrochemistry. Okay, and uh, with Jax, uh, at the time, Analchem was not so good. Okay, uh, this is Royce Murray who remade the Analchem, a very good uh, journal. Okay. Uh, 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 and he should be thanked for that because now this is a top uh, analytical journal, okay? But the thing was, uh, when I was opening the JAX, I was uh, take, uh, going through the whole, the whole uh, journal. And uh, I will read some title, read the abstract, I will read some paper in uh, full, even if they were not directly related to my work, okay? But I could do that because... Uh, Interesting, uh, okay, uh, was also uh, edito uh, also uh, the communication, chem chemical communication from the Royal Society uh, of Chemistry, uh, okay, a few uh, journals like this, but you had time to do work and read, okay? Now I see that even if I was to read only the papers that are related to where I am working, I will spend more than 24 hours per day, okay? So this is physically impossible, okay? We still pretend that we read the, uh, the papers, 
but it's impossible physically to read everything which is produced today, okay? Mm -hmm. So this means that we are, uh, when I see my students in my lab, they interrogate uh, web uh, of science, uh, they uh, interrogate this kind of thing with keywords. And so they have access only to the things that they have demanded. So this is very important because you can have access with open access directly to the paper, or if you have uh, the proper uh, contract with the publisher, you can have the PDF. Uh, before you had to go to the library, if somebody was using the copy of the journal, you have to wait to, to, to read it uh, and so on. Okay, so this is fantastic. But on the other hand, you get access only to what you know that you want to have access. And the novelty is hidden where you don't know uh, that you will need that business, okay? Right. So, for example, when you go to uh, a, a, a conference where you have uh, thousands of symposiums in parallel, you will go to your symposium, okay? The one you are interested, maybe two or three, okay? Then you listen things that you almost already know, okay? So this is important, but uh, okay, most of the time in Pitcon next week, I will be spending my time for nothing, okay, because I will listen things that I know already, maybe new development, but on things that uh, uh, I know already most of it, okay? Mm -hmm. But now when you go to the global conference where you have to attend the, all the speakers, you are listening to somebody who is coming and speaking to you about something that you do not care about. And then when the person is speaking, you say, oh, gee, this is fantastic. <laughs> but this is uh, something that uh, if I was to apply the same reasoning or this kind of uh, perspective to my own work, uh, now uh, I can solve this problem, okay? And that, because of this inflation of publication, we cannot uh, document ourselves where we don't know. We go to get the information only where we know the information we need. Okay, so this is fantastic in one side, but killing the uh, perspective of increasing the knowledge uh, where you don't know knowledge exists. Okay, you understand what I mean? I do, uh, and uh, I think and that's... So, and I think the system will crack, okay, because it's impossible. When uh, you, you, okay, now you are, uh, globally, uh, it is produced more than 10 times the number of paper you can physically read, even if you don't do any other work, okay? But, uh, but when it will go to 1,000, it, it will be completely impossible. Even using computers and so on, uh, you will lose a lot of piece of work. Especially that one of things, remember, that with the system that we have, if something is really new, it hardly comes to the big journals. Okay? Because it's new, so, for example, when I started to do publish with Whiteman microelectrodes, uh, it could be published only in the Journal of Electronical Chemistry because Parsons, that was before the cold fusion, he was an open-minded, and he thought, okay, this is funny, okay, it's good work, let's publish it, okay? You, you understand? Yes. But today... Nobody will buy the microelectrode uh, we were doing before because we could not demonstrate that it was useful. I see. That would have been a challenge. And so, uh, remember one thing. The guy who got the Nobel Prize for uh, uh, STM, scanning tuning microscopy, nobody wanted to have their paper, okay? So they published in a very obscure journal, okay? Two years after, they got the Nobel Prize, okay? And why they got the Nobel Prize, and why this thing did not remain obscure, because they were in IBM. So each time a good scientist will come to visit the IBM in Zurich, the people of the IBM were showing this uh, business of the STM. So very quickly, the knowledge has been diffusing, not from the paper, because the pe people will get the paper as a reprint, okay? and. Uh, STM became a method because when these people from IBM sent their paper, the referee looked to that and say, 
these people are completely idiot. It's impossible to see atoms, yeah? Yes. So how comes with a little point, they can see the atoms, okay? So this is uh, some people who stop, should stop to sniff uh, marijuana, okay? I um, I wasn't familiar with that story, although I believe... Uh, what is the the name of the scientist uh, that... Uh, the STM... Because I believe he spoke as a plenary lecturer at one of our meetings. Um, uh, uh, okay, I cannot uh, tell you the names because uh, with the multiplication tables, uh, <laughs> I am with multiplication tables and with names. But if you look, uh, if you type, type on Google uh, yeah. Nobel Prize for yeah. STM, you will get the names. Uh, this is the IBM people uh, from uh, from Zurich. Yes, yes, uh, no, that's, and that's who it was who spoke. And, and I, but I just was unaware of the. Uh, but then after AFM atomic force microscopy, and no problem to be published because already the STM showed that you could see the atoms. Because in fact, that was the first time in life where you could see atoms. Okay, the electronic density uh, created by atoms, okay, not really the atoms, okay, but the electronic de density. And that was the first time in the human life where somebody could uh, uh, really see a picture of an atom. Before atom were a coherent concept, okay, that was uh, enabling uh, the possibility of uh, uh, explaining chemical reaction and so on, but nobody had ever seen an atom. Okay, you, you understand? Mm -hmm. Now, if you would take a student, uh, a freshman student, uh, they know that uh, you can see the atoms, you can see the molecule, you can see the organization of molecules on surfaces and so on. But uh, when I was a student, uh, when I entered the Ecole Normale Supérieure in uh, '71. If you had told me that, I would say, okay, uh, uh, okay, cool guy, cool guy, okay, because uh, everybody knows that you cannot see the atoms, they are too, too small, okay? So, in fact, uh, uh, when you open uh, uh, a new thing, okay, uh, it is very hard to get uh, published in the journals that will be accessible by everybody. Yes, okay? yeah. Uh, my research team here quickly t uh, took a look, and it's. Uh, I think we were we we're talking about Gerd Benning earlier. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so um, I, actually, what I'd, I'd like to do uh, uh, now uh, to the uh, end of this uh, conclusion at this is, is talk about uh, t uh, meetings and and uh, the ECS 229th meeting uh, in particular in San Diego, where you're going to be giving a talk, and can you share anything? Mm -hmm about that talk that's uh, entitled Seeing, Measuring, and Understanding Vesicular Exos Exocytosis of, of <laughs> Neurotransmitters. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it, uh, I made this title uh, provocative, okay, because uh, vesicular exocytosis it is of neurotransmitters is what you have in your neurons that uh, are sending the influx to the next neuron, okay? This is the way we are thinking, but you have that in the, your nerves. When you bu uh, move your muscles, uh, you have that in your guts, to, uh, you are, uh, everywhere, okay? Uh, the brain is commanding uh, the action of uh, different effectors, cell, okay, by sending uh, chemical messengers, okay? And that... Uh, messenger are contained into vesicles that are in the cell and when uh, uh, there is a command uh, by calcium and trans uh, calcium ions and trans into the cell the cell will release that which is contained uh, like a cargo in a vesicle and uh, uh, so the problem that uh, we are several okay started with uh, white man and me and then you have many other people uh, in the world, and the Andrew Ewing, uh, many other people, try to understand what is happening when the vesicle is releasing the neurotransmitter, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, the problem is, uh, when I say seeing, is because uh, biologists, okay, uh, I am not uh, uh, making
making uh, caricature, but uh, more and more you open uh, science, nature, and so on, what you see is photographs, okay? Photographs are pictures, so people uh, are seeing a phenomenon, but seeing a phenomenon does not mean you understand the phenomenon, okay? You, you, uh, there is a big di uh, difference, right. okay? Uh, now you have the analytical chemist, Generally, they are making the measurement, but what they produce is the measurement, the result of the measurement, or the method for measuring. But ultimately, the science, academic science, to which I belong, is to provide understanding. So it's not the important thing of seeing and measuring, is how you can see, measure, and use that to understand, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is why my title is like this, and I will try to explain that uh, during my uh, lecture in the SES, which is quite a big honor for me, okay? Well, it's, it's going to be a, a privilege uh, to have you as our uh, plenary speaker, uh, uh, and I, we all look forward to it. Um, and I want to thank you for sharing that uh, little piece uh, to uh, people can listen to and, and, and uh, prepare for, to uh, attend the meeting. And, and I want to thank you for uh, the, uh, sharing y your story with us today. It, it was uh, a great opportunity for us to uh, listen to your experience and, and talk about electrochemistry. And do you have any final thoughts uh, that you'd like to share? No, I have no uh, uh, real uh, thought because uh, thanks to the, the set of questions that you uh, defined, uh, we have been spanning a lot of things. I don't know how that will be received by the people who will listen to it, but what I want to say is that science is a marvelous adventure, okay? Because this is uh, one with, uh, I would say, painting and carving. Uh, science, the need for understanding in nature or the world around, is one of the most ancient art of humanity. You find that uh, already scientific details uh, and so on, uh, starting uh, from uh, the cave painting and so on. Uh, when you speak about the Australian uh, painting, this is a scientific way to put, uh, according to a code that only the ancient people could read, okay? Uh, but uh, how to find uh, where is the water point, uh, where is the place where you can get food uh, in this desert, okay? So people, uh, this is one of the maximum demand of uh, humans. If you take kids, uh, if you have kids, okay, uh, I know that my two mine uh, with my wife, we were very happy when they will go to bed because all the day it was dad or mom, why is this, why is that? So I, I was saying to my wife, they are making us pay that with what we did to our parents, okay? So I think the human brain, the human understanding wants uh, has a need for understanding, okay? And today, who is bringing this understanding? When is social science and when it is behavior and so on? Generally, this is uh, writers. When you read Tony Morrison, you understand a lot about uh, social uh, problem uh, related to be a black uh, person and a woman in this country at uh, some period of the time, okay? Uh, when uh, you uh, read uh, scientific things, you understand better uh, how your own body is working, okay? And I think this is the most exciting thing in the thing and the most demanding thing for humans. That, I could not live in a world where there is no art and where there is no science. Thanks, Christian. Dr. Amateur has among his awards the Galvani Medal from the Italian Chemical Society and the Faraday Medal from the Royal Society of Chemistry. He is also giving the ECS lecture at the 229th ECS meeting this spring in San Diego, California. Remember, you can find ECS on Twitter at ECSorg, listen to more episodes of our podcast by searching ECS Podcast on iTunes, 
or just go to our website at electrochem.org. Thanks for joining us today.